Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Samantha Rayner, a Professor of Publishing and Book Coaches in the Department of Information Studies at UCL. And as co-director of the Bloomsbury chapter, I'd like to welcome you all to the Stevenson Lecture for 2021. This is an annual lecture set up in honor of UCL's late Professor of Publishing, Ian Stevenson, who along with Professor Simon Elliott from the Institute of English Studies, had this idea, now a reality of a collaborative initiative bringing together staff and students from the two institutions. The Bloomsbury chapter was launched a few years ago and the Stevenson Lecture is our key event, which also gives us a chance to award the Stevenson Prize. Ian set up the MA in Publishing at UCL back in 2006, and we thought a prize in his name for a student on the course would be an appropriate way to remember him. In consultation with Ian's family, it was decided that the prize should be given to a student based on the following criteria. One, entrepreneurial spirit, someone who has gone above and beyond to create something worthwhile on the course. This could be a project, a little side business or a community effort. Two, community spirit, someone who has supported their fellow students and engaged with the course over the year. And finally, commitment to and passion for the profession, someone who has shown commitment to the publishing industry through community or industry engagement. And this year, we are awarding the prize for the class of 2019-20. And I am thrilled to announce that it was unanimous that the prize should go to Manon Wright, who with her commitment to all aspects of the programme throughout what was a very challenging year, her input into the Department of Information Studies centenary celebrations with her brilliant designs and her continued generous support to students beyond the course's time makes her a very fitting recipient of what Manon will be a beautiful trophy, which will be sent to you in the post. <laughs> so congratulations to you from all of us um, at UCL and at the Institute of English Studies. Um, well done. Uh, would you like to say a few words, Manon? Uh, sure. I just want to say thank you. It was such a lovely surprise after uh, such a long time uh, since the course. I really loved my time on the course and I wish I could have spent more time in person with everyone. It really gave me the opportunity to learn everything that I needed to more confidently go into the publishing industry. And it gave me an opportunity to challenge myself academically. So I want to thank my tutors for all of your guidance and for my friends and families who kept me sane through lockdown doing uh you know a dissertation and stuff so yeah. thank you no it's uh, it's a real pleasure um the team are all here i'm sure in the background even though you can't see them and uh, i wish there was an applause button but please uh, accept the prize with lots of um silent applause from everybody well done manon thank you so much um Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Andrew Nash, uh, my co-director of the Bloomsbury chapter and director of the London Red Book School, to introduce our plenary speaker. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, Sam. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce the speaker for this year's Bloomsbury chapter Stevenson lecture. Caroline Davis's work in book history and publishing studies, especially post-colonial publishing and publishing in 20th century Africa, is, I'm sure, well known to many of you in the audience. Caroline has recently taken up the post of Associate Professor in the UCL Centre for Publishing, part of the Department of Information Science. Prior to this, she worked for many years on the Publishing Studies programme at Oxford Books University. Her first book, Creating Postcolonial Literature, African Writers and British Publishers, which appeared in 2013, focused mostly on the activities of Oxford University Press and in particular their successful Three Crowns series. This was followed in 2015 by a volume co-edited with David Johnson entitled The Book in Africa, Critical Debates. Most recently in this area, she's produced a short monograph entitled African Literature and the CIA, Networks of Authorship and Publishing for the Cambridge University Press series, Elements in Book Publishing and Book Culture. And Caroline's undergraduate and postgraduate teaching encompass a wide range of, of um, approaches to the subject, and she's recently produced a very helpful introductory textbook, Print Culture, a Reader in Theory and Practice. In 2020, she was awarded a British Academy Mid-Career Fellowship for further study of British publishing in Africa, taking the, her investigations back to the period 1900 to 1965. And I think it is this topic, which will be the subject of her lecture today, 
which is entitled Book Empires Investigating British Publishing in Colonial Africa. So over to you, Caroline. You'd like to un unmute yourself? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that kind introduction. Um, can you hear me, Andrew? Yeah. Okay, good. Assume I assume you can all hear me. Um, so firstly, uh, I'd like to really thank uh, Andrew and Sam for their very kind invitation to give this year's Stevenson Lecture. Uh, it's a great honour to be asked to give this talk in commemoration of Ian's life and his huge contribution to publishing history as a field of study. I mean, he was phenomenal um, knowledge and great generosity in the way that he um, shared his knowledge with people. And I was very indebted to him for his actual uh, help with me on this particular project that I'm carrying out at the moment. He gave me some fantastic advice. And I now have the privilege of working in um, the department that he set up, uh, as Sam said, in 2006, uh, in the, the MA in um, publishing, publishing at UCL. Uh, where I've just been studying, I'm sorry, I've just been um, working since September. Um, so I'm going to start my talk um, with a story uh, that Chinua Achebe told on several occasions about reading English novel novels about Africa in his school library in Nigeria in the 1940s. Um, he wrote of his fascination for what he termed sensational writing about Africa and Africans by European travellers, which is kind of the subject of my talk. So I'm going to just um, talk a bit about how he, um, his different reading experiences of these novels. Um, he started, sorry, he, his, he, initially he, um, he loved them. He said, I did indeed read on my own a few African novels by such writers, ride, writers as Ryder Haggard and John Buchan, but I did not connect the Africa in those riveting adventure stories among savages, even remotely with myself or my homeland. And elsewhere, he wrote about, he wrote, I did not see myself as an African to begin with. The, right, the, white, man, the white man was good and reasonable and intelligent and courageous. The savages arrayed against him were sinister and stupid or at the most cunning. I hated their guts. Um, and then only later uh, as a university student, he um, sort of revised this view and he started to analyze the political function that the, the literature served as a, as a justification for colonialism. Uh, and he wrote, in the end, I began to understand there is such a thing as absolute power over narrative. Those who secure this privilege for themselves can arrange stories about others pretty much where and as they like. So my current research project involves trying to find out the role of publishers in achieving this absolute power over narrative and securing this privilege to arrange stories about Africa as and where they liked um, during this period of con colonization. Um, and I'm sure you'll all be aware of the recent attention that's been paid to the colonial histories of many British publishing institutions. Um, for example, um, museums and uh, National Trust and uh, architectural you know, buildings in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but the colonial history of British publishing has largely escaped um, and yeah, it's largely escaped such attention and scrutiny. Researchers um, instead sort of tended to concentrate on the idea of Africa and how it was constituted in British literature during the process, during the period of colonization. For example, um, in the important studies by Dorothy Hammond and Elsa Jablo, Patrick Brantlinger and Philip Curtin. And um, the, the um, sorry, um, yeah, the, probably the most influential of these studies was by um, Mudimbi in his Idea of Africa, which was published in 1994, which focuses on the whole corpus of European texts on Africa, which he terms the colonial library. Um, and this is a product of the West in a powerful yet invisible epistemological order that seemed to make possible at a given period, a different type of discourse about Africa. However, um, this sort of body of scholarship tends to concentrate on the texts themselves and not with the institutional means by which this Eurocentric idea of Africa was actually produced, propagated and circulated. 
And, and I think to publishing a historian like me, this raises a number of questions about who created this corpus of texts, who were the gatekeepers, uh, what was this process of um, literary production, how were the books disseminated and to whom. Um, theories and models of publishing also tend to minimise this ideological and political role of the publisher. Um, Bourdieu's model of the publisher as a merchant of art positioned on this continuum between culture and commerce has been highly influential. Um, and this idea of, an, of a publisher as an intermediary, negotiating and determining the cultural and economic value of literature has, you know, it's been a, very influential, but it does fail to explain the political and ideological interventions of a publisher in shaping texts. And, um, and I'm particularly, my line of research, particularly interested in examining these networks and alliances between publishers and government that underpinned the colonial British book trade. Uncovering these colonial histories of publishers is, however, surprisingly difficult. Um, publishing firms have almost without exception ignored their histories in Africa. These histories have not been documented in the official history books, more well, barely. And publishers' archival records tend to be largely inaccessible and un un uncatalogued, or um, their archives have been accidentally or deliberately destroyed. And the books they published about Africa tend to be long, out of print and forgotten. So, um, as Andrew said, I've been very fortunate to have a British Academy Fellowship um, which investigates the colonial networks of the book in Africa. And in this lecture, I'm going to be talking a bit about the methodologies I've been, well, the methods I've been using to unearth British publishing's colonial past and to try to shed light on this hidden history. Um, so one of the one of the sort of new methods I've been exploring in this in this project is using bibliographic data uh, in a way in to try and sort of reveal these sort of hidden trends and patterns in this publishing history. Uh, it's a mode of study that um, Franco Moretti terms distant reading. Um, with the help of two research assistants, I've created several databases from British Library and Bodleian Library records. And um, the one I'll, the the database I'll be discussing today is a data set of British publications related to Africa from 1900 to 1965, uh, which has been created via EndNote by means of a series of keyword searches and has resulted in a database of over 20,000 records. So these are all books which, have, which um, are related to Africa published in that period. But today I'm going to be focusing on the books specifically related, related to the earlier period in, the, in between 1900 and 1945. Um, and this is a, a fairly crude method of analysis. Records are missing. Uh, many have been poorly catalogued. Um, the identity of lots of the publishers is just not being recorded. Uh, and it's impossible to identify all the books related to Africa by keyword searches. So it's a broad brush and imperfect tool, but it's still, I think it's a way of seeing some trends and some very important patterns which start to emerge. Um, what's abundantly clear um, is that Africa was a subject of enduring interest to British publishers and readers in the, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and approximately 6,000 new books were, were published in this period by British publishers. Uh, and the largest, as you can see from this graph, the largest of these um, groups of publishers were commercial publishers. But this was there are also a number of books published by the British government and the missionary press. And you can see that not, not quite as many, but they're, they were still very significant publishers. And I'm sort of trying to, I'm paying attention to what they were publishing and when, but actually my main, um, my main focus of this study is the commercial book publishers. And um, my research has sort of enabled me to determine who these main publishers were. And it shows that the majority were what we would call consumer publishers. So they were fiction and non-fiction publishers. Um, and, but they were also, throughout the period, there was a, there was a sort of fairly steady number of academic titles published about Africa across a number of different disciplines. So geography, cartography, history, anthropology, ethnography, politics, education, and military studies were just some of the, the um, key subjects. And that's, of course, a project in its own right, sort of seeing how these different um, discourses on Africa developed. But what's, um, 
has also been really useful to me is just seeing how many publishers were, how many British publishers were publishing these African related titles. I mean, there was around one, I I counted 1,300 firms and organizations that published books on Africa. Um, Many of them, of course, just publishing one title, but here's a list of the major ones. So the, the publishers that published over 45 titles in this period, um, and as you can see, OUP, Longmans and Macmillan are very dominant, but also a number of publishers I, whose work I wasn't so aware of. So Francis Day and Hunter, Murray, Methuen, Hutchinson, Constable and T. Fisher Unwin. And this enables you to, of course, drill down and see which books were specifically being published, call them up. You know, it's a, it's a great way of carrying out this kind of research. Another really important sort of pattern that, um, that you can notice is the huge inequalities in the um, in what was being published. So of the 6,000 books that were published related to Africa in this period, only 71 were published, sorry, only 71 were written by black writers. And that includes Af- all African writers. Um, so only, only 1% of the books. And these are, again, this is books published in Britain. I'm not looking at books published across Africa here. Um, but clearly the British book trade was neither a conducive nor an accessible form forum for African literary, intellectual or cultural activity in this period. And the other sort of pattern that I've noticed is that the uh, only a very small minority of these books were um, directly anti-colonial. Uh, again, this is a, a rough measure, but I've only identified 160 of these 6,000 books as being critical of colonial rule or under 3%. So, I mean, of course, there are a huge number of anti-colonial book texts that were published in this period that were not books. So more ephemeral texts, maybe pamphlets, speeches, letters, magazines, newspapers. Um, but the book culture was clearly um, predominantly uh, sort of, yeah, more colonial or, or, or neutral politically. So. Um, so I am tracing, trying to trace these, these book networks as part of my project, but that's very much ongoing research. So um, this quantitative data does provide some really important insights and evidence of the African-related books that were published in Britain, and it absolutely confirms Madimbi's argument that the idea of Africa that was propagated in Britain was almost exclusively the product of Europeans. And it draws attention to the vast inequalities of British book culture in the early 20th century. However, for detailed understanding, it's necessary to drill down into the case studies of particular publishers and carry out research into what remains of their archives, their their catalogues and their individual publications. And to illustrate this, I'm going to turn to the case study of Thomas Nelson's books about Africa in the period 1906 to 1918, when John Buckham was both a principal literary editor and also the firm's most prominent author. So before arriving at Thomas Nelson in 1906, uh, John Buckham established some very important political and business networks, which were to become crucial to him, both as an author and an editor. He was born in um, Perth in Scotland And he studied at Oxford University from 1895 to 1899. And this is a really important place for his future networks. Um, He met there Tommy Nelson, the future director of Thomas Nelson, and also a group of students who were all collectively um, and subsequently involved in the reconstruction of South Africa after the Anglo-Boer War, um, who were known as Milner's Kindergarten. So... With with these um, other people, he went to the Transvaal from 1901 to 1903 as assistant private secretary to Viscount Milner, the High Commissioner for Southern Africa. And during the final stages of the Anglo-Boer War, he was responsible for taking over on behalf of the civilian government, the notorious concentration camps there. And he was involved in shaping the post-war settlement and Milner's land scheme. 
He returned to um, London in 1903, a self-confessed convert and fanatic about the British Empire. And he wrote a blueprint for the future of South Africa within the British Empire called the African Colony, which set out his unrepeatably racist views, uh, literally unrepeatedly, um, like, you know, horrendous. And, um, and it includes a lengthy, lengthy defence of Milner's policies of racial segregation and the denial of voting rights to Africans in South Africa. He, um, his key concern is with racial fitness and specifically the preservation of white racial vigor and the necessity for racial separation. The, um, the book concludes with Buchan's vision of a unified white South Africa under the guardianship of, British, of the British Empire. So how did these, um, how, what was the impact then of these um, sort of entangled colonial networks and this very um, fervent colonial ideology on Buchan's work as editor for Thomas Nelson? Uh, Thomas, Thomas Nelson at the time was um, an Edinburgh-based mass market publisher, had a London office uh, with a reputation for vigorous and wholesome books, and it specialised in cheap, cheap editions. And Buckham was brought in to the firm as a literary advisor in 1906 and was later pr promoted to London based editor and then editorial director of the firm until his retirement in 1929. He became editor of um, Buckham's most, sorry, Buckham became editor of Nelson's most popular fiction and non fiction book series, including the Six Penny Classic series, the Nelson Library of Copyright Fiction, the Schilling Library, and the Two Schilling Library of new novels. Um, and he revived his, the, the children's list, Nelson's children's list, by reissuing re pro-Empire texts from the backlist, including stories by G.A. Henty and um, uh, R.M. Ballantyne's adventure stories. And also, as you can see here, the, he, he managed to secure the, the, um, the guide handbook. Uh, which is the subtitle was How Girls Can Help Build the Empire. This is by Agnes Baden-Powell and Robert Baden-Powell. So um, he, also, he also worked on the adult list. So he managed to acquire rights to reprint a number of titles about British colonial adventures and military conquest, um, books for both adults and adolescents. And there's some examples here. There was... Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, G. W. Stevens with Kitchener to Khartoum and Demetrius Bulger's The Life of General Gordon and Andrew uh, Attridge's Famous Modern Battles. Um, you, you kind of get the idea. And um, I think probably one of the most, uh, to my mind, one of the most shocking, but also one of the most popular and frequently reprinted books in Nelson's Schilling Library under uh, Buckingham's editorships was, was um, E. S. Grogan's memoir of his, of his walking journey across the length of Africa, entitled From the Cape to Cairo. Uh, this, this was first published in 1900 with a foreword by Cecil Rhodes. Uh, and then the edition from Nelson was a cheap, um, small edition for the mass market. And Grogan's narrative is full of highly derogatory descriptions of Africans whom he describes as low in the evolutionary hierarchy and inferior to animals. And he actually at one point regrets that the bene beneficent rule of the white man in Africa was preventing the annihilation of the indigenous people. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's very, it makes for a very unpleasant reading. But the edition was popular and enduring and it continued to be advertised in Nelson's catalogue for several decades. So Buchan's work as an editor shows how these colonial narratives from the Victorian era continue to be recycled well into the 20th century and how racist and eugenicist discourse was circulated to a mass reading public. And I think what's surprising is not only what was published, but also what was not published. Um, in a period of intense anti-colonial disputes and debates, there was a complete absence of dissenting opinion in Nelson's books. No critiques of British Empire were published by the firm and Nelson's books about Africa included none whatsoever by African writers. But of all the books that were published in, um, by, book, by Buchan, none was more popular than his own novel, 
Prester John, which was published by Nelson in 1910. Um, this book was in many ways an archetype of the colonial novel form with its white adventure, adventurer hero, the Scottish teenager David Crawford, who travels to Southern Africa and seeks to combat threats to white rule and defeat African resistance. David Crawford confronts Robert, sorry, he confronts Reverend John Laputu, who is by day an educated minister, described as a great pet of missionary societies, but by night he's in the incarcerated, sorry, he's named the incarcerated spirit of Prester John. He's the leader of a Swazi and Zulu resistance movement whose mission is to lead the African race to conquest an empire. Uh, Laputu poses a unique threat to white rule in Africa. But in the story, he's ultimately outwitted and fatally wounded by Crawford, and his army is finally placed, and I quote, under guard, disarmed, and awaiting repatriation. Um, and the book ends with um, the following sort of defense of white supremacy in Africa. I knew then that the meaning of the white, I knew, sorry, I'll start again. I knew then the meaning of the white man's duty. He had to take all risks, risking wrecking nothing of his life or his fortunes and well content to find his reward in the fulfillment of his task. That is the difference between white and black, the gift of responsibility, the power of being in a little way a king. And so long as we know this and practice it, we will rule not, only, not in Africa alone, but wherever there are dark men who live only for the day and their own bellies. So this is like, yeah, again, reiterating the same um, imperial and racist ideology that informed his um, African colony written seven years earlier. The, um, the publication strategy for Prester John demonstrates Buchan's talent for reaching a mass reading public. Upon his recommendation, the book was published not only for adolescent boys, but also for adult readers. Tommy Nelson suggested it was published as a children's reward book, but Buchan wanted it to be published for both adults and children. And actually it was first published in the um, two shilling series uh, as a, and then later on was published for children. And he took great care during the, during the, during the process of publication that this should be, um, he was very interested in the book design and production. And as you can see from here, the first edition had a very decorative and exotic co cover with an illustration of John Laputa the, um, or, or Prester John on the front. Uh, and he requested that figures on the front were redrawn very more distinctly and that the colors were altered. He wanted more rose to be put into the rubies and less magenta and gave specific instructions about the quality of the paper and the amount of gilding that should be used on the edges. He even designed a lavish gold stamp for the book cover, uh, which, yeah, looks like a Nazi symbol, but anyway. Um, so the, the strategy was successful for the book became an international bestseller. It was first issued in 1910 and then was issued by Nelson in many editions. Um, so we see here in the 1932 edition of Prester John and then uh, later in the decade, the um, teaching of English series, which was um, possibly that, that, that was possibly the, the edition that found its way into Achebe's school library. So Prester John, which was notable for its ideological service to the British Empire, became one of Nelson's most enduring and popular titles in the first half of the 20th century. And finally, um, Buchan uh, served as a propagandist. Um, during the First World War, he assumed the role, the new role as a war scribe, writing patriotic articles and books about the progress of the war in South Africa and elsewhere to boost the morale of the readers. And in 1917, he was appointed director of the Department of Information by the Prime Minister Lloyd George on the recommendation of Lord, Lord Milner, who he'd previously worked for in the Transvaal. In this capacity, the boundaries between his work at Nelson and his work for the Foreign Office became porous. But he continued to carry out his duties as director of Nelson's reading manuscripts, and answering correspondence on Department for Information, sorry, Department for Information headed note paper. And, as, and he carried on establishing contacts with Nelson and other publish, book publishers for the covert publishing of propaganda aimed at European audiences. 
and American audiences. Uh, Kate MacDonald calls these muddily demarcated transactions in which Buchan merged the propaganda concerns of his wartime government, of the wartime government, closely with the publishing strategy of his own firm. He, he commissioned a number of books, which were issued under the imprint of established British publishing companies, thus disguising their source as official propaganda. In addition to Thomas Nelson, the uh, publishers favoured by Buckham were Allen and Unwin, Heinemann and the Athenian Press, as well as, as, well as the publisher of his own novels, um, Hodder and Stolten. He came to mutually beneficial arrangements whereby the publishers were paid for the publication and also had guaranteed sales, in, sales income. These firms were in, enlisted to publish government propaganda under their own imprints, disguising the government, government source of the information. And he ordered 17,000 copies of his own book, Battle of the Somme, which was first published by Nelson in 1916, to be published as government propaganda under Nelson's imprint. Um, he later became heavily criticised for this arrangement by Robert Donald, who was editor of the Chronicle. He led a, an investigation into Buchan's department and concluded that, I quote, the whole system is most unbusinesslike and simply means an arrangement for subsidising publishers and particularly a selected list of publishers. So he thought this was highly corrupt. Um, and actually, soon after, Buchan's period of control over the Department of Information came to an end in 1918. But while it lasted, he, he um, used it to draw Thomas Nelson's and other prominent book publishing companies seamlessly within the official British propaganda effort. His roles as author, publisher and government propagandist thus became inter interconnected and virtually inseparable. Um, so this case, case study doesn't correspond well with Bourdieu's model of publishing being un, very autonomous and separate from the political field. Instead, it suggests that successful book publishers were linked closely to, within the, the political field. And uh, as I've sort of tried to show in this, in this diagram, and were closely connected to and reliant upon the state. So Nelson's cheap and accessible books became an influential means by which Victorian myths of Africa were repackaged and colonial discourses were circulated for a new generation of readers in, in Britain and across the empire. Um, this explains how his novel Prester John, with its tropes of the white savior and the noble savage, came to be read by Achebe in his school library over 30 years after it was first published in London. These alliances between publishers and government were symbiotic and mutually advantageous. Buchan wrote and published books in defence of the British Empire and of British policies in South Africa. And he and Nelson's benefited from a close and sustaining relationship with the government. This illustrates well the role of the book publisher in contributing to what, what Pat, Patrick Brantlinger terms a deluge of ruling discourse about Africa in this period. These histories are uh, undoubtedly difficult to excavate, but it's important to do so, in my view, as the legacies of this colonial past undoubtedly remain in, in British book publishing culture today and in the publishing industry today. Um, so returning to Achebe's observation, this case study helps to show how, in one particular instance, absolute power over narrative was secured in the, in the colonial period. These hidden networks underpinning the book in the colonial book trade helped to explain who held the power to tell stories about others, whose stories were forgotten or silenced, and, who's, and in whose interests these stories were written and whose interests these stories served. So thank you very much. <laughs>